Nish, thank you, Rakesh, and, and good morning to all of you guys uh, on behalf of Edelweiss, IIF, and AIWM. We've come a really, we've come a long way in the fact that we have a full room on a Friday morning. But five years ago, when I started the first AIF, it looked very, very different. We started with a dream of creating an industry in 2012. And it was a slog to raise even the first 20 crores. And today, we're in the midst of an economic revolution where even a 1,000 crore fundraise is considered par for the course. And today morning, I want to walk you through that economic revolution. And I want to invite you to join this exciting journey along with me. I don't have a lot of slides, but I've kept it very interesting kept it candid because we're among friends. And I've also kept a lot of time for Q&A. Okay. So as you guys know, uh, and as Tejesh so eloquently covered in the morning, there are three categories of funds. Category one, which covers largely venture capital and infra. Category two, which is real estate and private equity. And category three, which is focused on the listed space. And all three categories have seen very, very explosive growth. But we have a long way to go. Today, to give you a sense, the whole, all three categories put together, all 375 license holders put together, manage about 1.4 lakh crores. And to put that number in reference, the mutual fund industry is about 22, 23 lakh crores. So we're not even one tenth of the mutual fund industry today. And we have seen a steady stream of launches across categories, largely focused on category two and category three more recently. Right? But there is investor demand for every single one of these investment types and in the asset classes. Let me dive a little deeper because oftentimes AUM is reported on the amount of commitments that are raised. But the way I like to look at it is how much money is actually getting put to work. So here is, if you look at the chart on the left, this is the amount of commitments raised, which is the bars in blue. And the bars in red are the amount of investments made. So if you look at this, Category two has raised about 90,000 crores of commitments, but they've only deployed around 30,000 crores worth in actual investments. Category three, on the other hand, is almost even. So when we look at the opportunities, we are saying that category three is actually the space that is growing the fastest because that is where investors are actually putting hard money to work, right? And you can see that by the fact that both commitments and investments have grown the fastest in category three. About 150% CAGA over the last three years. Now that's on a small base, but that's still nothing to scoff about, right? This means that there is almost 30,000 crores of assets that are there in hedge fund and hedge fund like strategies today. And we're just scratching the surface. And by the way, category three was the residual category when the AIF regulations were formed. So many of you guys who have been in the markets for many years, you know that the AIF is the successor to the old private equity and venture capital regulations and category three came later. Now, with the amount of money coming into this space, SEBI and industry bodies are starting to really wake up and take notice. And this is starting to become a permanent fixture in portfolios of many, many high net worth individuals. Here's another interesting statistic. If a category is doing well, you would expect to see fund sizes increase, right? as 
investors gain confidence, they up and re-up their bets. That's different from having many, many small players in turn. Right? So if you look at this over the years, today a category two or a category three fund on average manages around 500 crores. And that has almost doubled in the last three years. And that's what I said at the beginning, that today even a, a thousand crore fundraise is considered par for the course. Whereas category one has largely been flat at around 200 crores. But that's not a reason to worry. I'll explain why in a minute. So that's the industry. Let me dive a little deeper into who are the players and what are they doing. Right? So these are three broad categories, one, two, and three. But when you talk to investors, when you talk to advisors and wealth managers, there is a more nuanced understanding of what people are doing. And I wanted to share that with you today. Okay, so in category one, there are broadly two kinds of funds that are running today. The first, which is about 18,000 crores, is venture capital. And this, if you see, is largely a collection of small boutiques, right? So Oreos, which is run by Rehan Yar Khan, Bloom, which is run by Sanjay Nath and Karthik Reddy, K Capital, which is run by Sasha Mirchandani. It is largely very, very individual VC-driven boutiques. The second category, and one that's growing very, very fast and large, is infrastructure, right? So this is the domain of very, very large players, Piramal, LNT, IlandFS, and Edelweiss. And this is a space that we think could become very, very large because there is a burning need for capital in India's infrastructure segment. And there is a big demand for yield, both from global investors as well as from domestic investors. So that's category one. Category two, interestingly, has four subcategories. Okay. The first is real estate. Okay. And this is largely real estate debt with maybe some equity. And this is again very large because again, there is a, a large appetite for real estate funds. And it is the domain of the people who have NBFCs or large real estate lending books. So prominent names are Bidla, HDFC, Edelweiss, IDFC, ICICI, et cetera. Okay? And this will probably take off in a much bigger way once the real estate cycle in India turns a little more favorable. The second is structured credit. This, uh, again, is a very popular segment. And in a bit, I'll tell you why this segment could actually become very, very large. Right? Uh, here, people are doing promoter financing, uh, you know, some amounts of loans against property, uh, you know, loan against shares, uh, opco, hold co financing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So that's is the left hand side is credit. Right. The right hand side is two categories of equity style funds. The first is your classic private equity, where people are investing for growth. And this today is largely the domain of, again, like venture capital, boutique firms. So whether it is Renuka Ramnath at multiples, uh, whether it is uh, Aditya Parekh at Fairing, uh, IVCA, uh, India Value Fund, which is now called True North, etc. This is a space that is dominated by boutique firms. And lastly, this the last category is something that has emerged in the last year, uh, really pioneered by IFL and Edelweiss, which is 
about 10,000 crores has been raised in pre-IPO or late stage private equity firms and IPO or early stage listed firms. This is different from private equity because these funds don't look to add any kind of operational value to promoters or to companies. They are purely financial investors, okay? So that's category two. Category three, again, has four kinds of funds inside of it. The first is what I would say are long-only platform funds, okay? Here, these are the large AMCs like a Bidla, like an ICICI, like a Motilal, a BlackRock, who are using the AIF platform as a, a vehicle. Instead of launching a closed-ended mutual fund or a closed-ended PMS, they're doing it on an AIF so that account opening is easier, so that it's easier to do, manage one pool of money, and in some cases, it can be also more commercially beneficial to advisors and partners. Okay, so this is a pure structuring business. The second is a space that many of you are interested in, which is boutique managers that are coming forward to launch AIFs, right? So this is examples of this, uh, Sumit Nagar at Malabar, or more recently, Kenneth Andrade, who was at IDFC for many, many years and has launched Old Bridge, right? So this is very distinct because it's manager driven rather than just a pooling vehicle. That's on the long only side. On the right hand side, in a category that is very, very fast growing and exciting are long short managers. And again, here there are two kinds of funds that are being developed. The first is where somebody has more of a debt risk profile. They're competing against a short-term fund or a arbitrage fund, and they're giving you consistent returns. So prominent players in this space are BSP BlackRock, Avendis, Edelweiss, etc. And the last category is, again, long short funds but which offer a much higher risk and commensurately a higher return. And here, players are Edelweiss, Red Art, Monsoon, and many other such players. Okay? So this is how category three is broken up. Long only on my right, and long short on my left. Okay? So these are the three categories, a lot of new startups, a lot of people come and often seek our advice on structuring, and not from a legal and compliance perspective, but from a business perspective. So what I thought I'd do next is answer a few of the burning questions that keep coming to us. The first is, I am a great proprietary trader, I'm managing a family office, you know, should I get into asset management or not? And there is a way to, there are two main things that you should evaluate when you ask this question. The first is that you've got to have an intrinsic desire to manage client money. And by that I mean genuine third party money, people who don't know you, right? If it's just about managing money for a few friends and family or acquaintances, then you can do that informally. You don't need to go down the AIF route. But if you're serious about managing genuine third party money, then jump head in because this is a fantastic opportunity. And the second is that there are many proprietary strategies or things that people are doing that are not scalable. They either rely on an ability to manage a very small amount of money or are reliant on leverage or concentration. So let me give you some examples of ideas that people have brought 
to me. There are a lot of high frequency trading firms that say that, look, we've got this brilliant index arbitrage strategy, but it requires, you know, five to 10 times leverage. You know, guess what? It's not gonna to translate to an AIF where leverage is capped at two times. Or somebody says, you know, I've got this great agri commodity ARB strategy, but it can only take 100 crores, you know? Probably won't work out. And more interestingly, and, and this is a real story, somebody came to me the other day and said, look, I want to start a Pico cap strategy. So I said, what is a Pico cap strategy, right? I'd heard of micro cap, which is companies less than 1,000 crore of market cap. I'd even heard of nano cap, which is companies less than 100 crores of market cap. But I'd never heard of Pico cap, which is companies less than 10 crores of market cap. So I said, okay, boss, so this is interesting. You know, let me find out more. I said, so what's this all about? He said, no, look, Nalan, you know, we're going to manage a focused, well-chosen basket of 20 Pico caps. I said, okay. Presumably, even if you could find 20 well-run companies that have less than a 10 crore market cap, if you just do the math, if I bought these entire companies outright, 20 times 10 is 200. Even if I became the promoter of 20 Pico caps, I'd only be managing 200 crores. So it's not gonna work in an AIF setting. And I thought I would just give you guys one very basic financial plan for how to think of proprietary funds versus AIFs, okay? And every one will be very different, but this is a template for how to think. So imagine you are managing about 200 crores in prop versus AMC, okay? And imagine that you are able to deliver around 15% in both cases. In the case of proprietary, you'd have a cost of funds. And again, I'm making some very basic assumptions that at three to one debt to equity and 15% cost of equity, 7% cost of debt, your cost of funds would be around nine. That means you'd make a 6% NIM. On the AIF, with a point net of what you would pay a distributor, let's say you made 0.25% management fees and 1% performance fees, so 1.25, okay? That means that your revenue on the proprietary side is about 12 crores, 6% of 192. And on the AIF side, it's about two and a half crores. So obviously, you're making more money in proprietary, but you're also deploying more capital. AIF is a lot more capital efficient. So this, at this point, the return on equity for both businesses is the same. Now obviously, this is very, very stylized. You know, when you manage an AIF, you'll also have marketing, legal, and other expenses. Uh, and you know, your strategy return could be higher or lower than 15. But our sense is that unless you are able to manage 500 crores, then it probably doesn't make sense to get into AIF from a business and a pure cash flow perspective. That doesn't mean you have to raise 500 crores on day one, but unlike the guy that's managing the Pico cap strategy, you must have some path to that. It's perfectly okay to start small and build over a period of time. That's what we did. When we started AIF in 2012, we started with a 20 crore fundraise. But today, across all of our strategies, we're probably managing around four and a half, five thousand 5,000 crores. This is another burning question that comes to me a lot. Should I manage a PMS or should I manage an AIF? And the answer is that it depends on what you're doing. So let me tell you very clearly, if you are a long only fund manager, if you are a classic stock picker, 
the best vehicle is a PMS. And I'll tell you why. First of all, the PMS allows you concentration. Many emerging managers want to manage portfolios of 10, 15, 20 stocks. In AIF, that's capped at 10%. If you pick a stock at 10% and it doubles because it's a multi-bagger, you'll have to sell back. You don't have to do that in PMS. You can customize fees and terms with clients. And this is important, you know, when you're starting out, when you're first establishing yourself, people are gonna negotiate with you, right? And you don't wanna lose business or deals because somebody wants a fee discount or wants a different hurdle rate or something of that sort. You've gotta be nimble. The minimum ticket size is 25 lakhs, and that's important. Uh, because it allows people to start small and try you out. So when I started Forefront, we looked at our data and we saw that actually fundraising follows a quadratic rule on minimum ticket size. So if I double the, if I double the minimum investment amount, I'll raise approximately one fourth the money. So, and it also, sometimes when people start small, it allows them to give, it allows them more mental space to give you time as a fund manager and that space to build a business. And it's also a very well-established market. You don't have to explain to anybody what a long-only PMS is. There are many, many people who have been doing this for 20 years and clients are very familiar. Some concerns about PMS that emerging managers have. One is, you know, look, I am a fund manager. I have only one or two people working with me. How am I going to open all these DMAT accounts and, you know, do individual client agreements, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's not an excuse. Get a great custodian, right? Somebody who's very technology oriented and today with India stack and a lot of things becoming digital, this is becoming easier and easier. But lean on your custodian. I agree, this is not a core competency, but lean on your custodian. I'm doing something top secret, right? A client will give me a small amount of money, 25 lakhs, and then replicate my holdings on the outside at a much larger size, therefore cheating me of fees or front running me. The reality is that nobody cares. Maybe one out of 100 customers will do that, but people are investing with you because they don't have the time themselves and they want you to do it for them. And people want an auditable track record. And sure, PMS, because it's managed accounts, does not have the perfect track record but if you have done well for customers, if they are happy, your business will scale regardless of whether that track record is exactly perfect or not. So that's not if you're a long only manager. If you're a hedge fund manager, if you're a trader, if you're doing long short, you've got to go for AIF. The simple reason is that you need leverage. AIF gives you only two times, but that's still enough to make do. If you're trading very actively, you've got daily market operations, then managing a single pool of money is very critical. You can't be managing, you know, 20, 30, or even more broking accounts or, uh, you know, individual portfolios where you're doing settlement. It's got to be pooled together. And secondly, lastly, is that if you're doing FNO, then a lot of people don't want FNO transactions on their books. So an AIF at least blocks that from the investor's pan card. Okay, so the message is very simple. If 
you're a long only manager, do PMS. If you are a AIF manager, if you're a hedge fund manager, do AIF. But in both cases, having a great custodian and prime broker is paramount. What do investors seek in long short funds? Right, because this is an emerging asset class and even within category three, the one that's growing the fastest. So be very clear to advisors and to customers whether you are a fixed income alternative or an equity alternative. If you're a fixed income alternative, people will want to see stability, monthly returns, capital protection. If you're an equity alternative, people want to see upside, they want to see tax efficiency, and they want to give you time. So don't confuse the two. Okay? Be prepared for a thorough vetting of what you're doing, right? Today, the market is evolved enough that you can't just show up and say, you know, trust me. Leave it to me, you know, I'll look at some charts, so you know, I will, you know, look at some statistical arbitrage pairs, or you know, this is my black box, and it will work. No. Clients and advisors are asking tough questions, right? And they want to know the following, right? They don't want to know everything down to the last detail, but you've got to be able to explain, are you a quant manager or a fundamental manager? Are you trading on technicals or on fundamentals? Are you looking at macro or micro, right? A lot of derivative portfolios have a huge amount of cash that is lying around. They want to know what are your policies around credit and duration management, right? They want to know about your risk management and stop losses, right? And they want to know what kind of gross and net exposure that you'll run and how you will use options. Will you buy options? Will you be selling options? Some combination of the two, right? Be clear. Now every manager in this space has his own style, has his own approach. There is no right or wrong answer, but be prepared to answer these kind of queries from people. Liquidity is very important, as well as fair fee structures. So for example, if you are managing a debt alternative, whatever you do, right, at the end of the day, a customer has to make at least 2% more than a arbitrage fund or a liquid fund post tax. Otherwise, it's not gonna cut it, right? You may be the greatest trader in the world, but because of fees or taxes, you end up delivering four to five percent post tax. Even with a brilliant sharp ratio, people are not going to be happy. Right? So you've got to have the right liquidity and fee terms. And this is very important, you know, and uh, this is a category which is still emerging. People want to hear new ideas. You've got to be able to go out and meet people and travel, right? That means that you need to have a team. And this doesn't mean that you have, you know, you can just hire a sales guy to do this. People want to hear from the decision maker, from the founder. So either you do the traveling and you have a set of fund managers or traders underneath you who can manage the day-to-day -day show or you have a co-founder who is an equivalent who only does business development. But this is one of the big reasons I think that we have succeeded and maybe others have not because we had a partner, Radhika Gupta, who's today the CEO of Edelweiss Mutual Fund, who really took on this role for us over the years, right? Uh, and if it means parting with some amount of equity in your AMC, so be it. Because you guys will grow and succeed together. 
some important hygiene factors on service providers, right? So these are all the service providers, and I've listed them in terms of one is to five as to how critical they are. So on your trustee, unlike a mutual fund, where trustees are very important, here as long as you go with an independent trustee who is reputed in the market, it's okay. Nobody ever asks you who your trustee is. But as one early AIF found out, having your dad as the trustee of the fund just doesn't cut it. Okay? On lawyers, go with somebody who is experienced, who's done this before, right? And who will take the task of filing, drafting, and vetting agreements very, very seriously and very carefully. This is reasonably important. I would rate this as a four on five, right? Because if you get this wrong halfway through your fundraise, you are dead on arrival. Custodians and fund accountants, this is like a marriage. And to be very honest, guys, I've learned this the hard way. So the business that we have built over the years has been a function of a lot of acquisitions, right? And we have dealt with probably six or seven different custodians and fund accountants over the years. Here, you need to go with somebody that has a capital markets background and who has a real hunger for this space. Because these are the guys that will help you on things like reporting of statements, processing of NAVs, trade settlement, cash management, and this is very, very critical. And once you get rolling, it becomes impossible to change a custodian, right? Uh, today, we are having to build a lot of the best practices around statements, around performance fee calculations, around you know account opening, and we are open sourcing all of this work through Edelweiss Custody, right? So you can go to Rakesh and team and say, hey, just give me the best practices from what Nalan is doing, and they will just port all of that technology and ideas straight to you. Brokers are critical, but not so critical, because you can always add more brokers or, or change them. Uh, but again, here be very careful, if you're trading very frequently, that you are not generating a disproportionate amount of brokerage, or doing it through a related party, because that is something that if customers feel or find out, it is a major reputational issue. And then finally, an auditor is also reasonably important. If you can get a big four, nothing like, uh, otherwise there are a number of smaller boutiques who are also pretty well versed in AIF. And then finally, a registrar, I found is not really required. You know, you don't need CAMS or CARVI for this uh, because you are not dealing with the kind of volume of customers that a mutual fund is dealing with, right? A good custodian can handle the load for you. So that's it on service providers. I'll end by just telling you guys about some new fund ideas and themes, right? Uh, and I'll talk about each of the three categories. So in category one, as I mentioned, infrastructure is a massive opportunity, massive. You know, this in itself could be five, 10 lakh crores with the kind of capital that India needs, as well as the kind of demand globally from LPs. But again, this will largely be a bulge bracket kind of play. This is not the domain of startups. And also global venture capital will come to India, right? So today, VC in India is dominated by, you know, a lot of the boutiques that I mentioned up front. But over a period of time, with the kind of success that Indian startups like Ola Cabs or Flipkart and all, or Paytm have experienced, and the kind of demand that is there from Indian investors, we do think that people like Kleiner Perkins or, you know, uh, other such players will come to India. On category two, 
high yield will become a very large category for two reasons. One, we feel that it will move from the mutual fund to AIF. Today, SEBI is really clamping down on mutual fund credit risk, right? They've asked AMCs to classify credit funds as being very high risk and AMCs are also becoming a little more wary about taking on deep credit risk with incidents like Amtec Auto or Balarpur Industries or Jindal Steel and Power affecting the reputation of these businesses, right? High yield will also move off NBFCs to AIFs for the simple reason that it's much more capital efficient to manage something in an AIF where you don't have capital adequacy norms or provisioning than it is to manage it in a NBFC. On the equity side, crossover funds will start to become a lot more popular. So obviously the pioneer in this space is somebody like a Westbridge, which invested both in late stage private equity as well as early stage public, right? So this hybrid between private and public will become more popular, right? For the simple reason that many early stage listed companies are effectively private in their needs and their requirements. And the last thing is capital solutions, right? So today, if you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, they're saying, we need money. I need money to grow my business. But they want funds to be flexible in how they give them that money and the terms on which they give them that money. Money could come in the form of structured credit, could come in the form of growth equity, could come in the form of, you know, some kind of back-ended structure, right? And there are n number of combinations, but essentially this is about listening to your end companies and giving them the right solution. And I think one great example of this is uh, Trifecta Capital, which is a pioneer in the field of venture debt. So here, they're saying that they're not investing for upside. They're coming in at series B in, all, in, in a bunch of established companies where the business model is fairly established. So like an Urban Clap or a Practo or other such companies. And they're lending the company money with a reasonable coupon and a little bit of equity upside. But for a lot of these fast growing VC firms, this allows them to maybe delay a fundraise from series B to series C for a year to two years, and that can mean a big difference in terms of the valuations that they raise at. Category three, the big floodgates will open when there is tax reform. And I've worked a lot on this with the Ministry of Finance, with SEBI, and industry bodies like the Narayan Murthy Committee or Indian Venture Capital Association. Most funds globally don't have taxation at the fund level. To use a very accounting parlance, most funds are either EEE, -E -E, exempt at time of investment, exempt in the fund and exempt at the time of redemption, or at best EET, -E which is taxed only at, the, at redemption. There, is, there are very few categories where it is ETE, which is taxation inside the fund. So this is something that we've got to get right. There is humongous, humongous demand for long short funds, both on the debt side, as interest rates have been very, vol very volatile. You've seen that in the last six, seven months with GSEC moving from about 6.4 to almost 7.8. And on the equity side, where people want equity upside or equity-like returns, but with a more smoother experience. So in either of these two categories, there is just limitless demand that we are seeing today. 
Commodities is a new asset class. So somebody in the break was asking me about commodities. And this is something that has been opened up to AIFs. It will also be opened up to PMS providers and to mutual funds. But this, somebody is yet to grab the bull by the horns on this front. And we think that probably somebody that is a specialized commodity house, whether in India or globally, is probably best suited for this asset class. And we've seen some, I've seen some indications of interest here. And then lastly, Gift City can throw up some interesting opportunities. Uh, and again, this is something to explore and consider. This is fairly nascent, but this is an important area that you should research and develop, okay? So I promised you 12 slides and that's all I have. So very happy to take questions. If you liked some of the ideas that I shared today, please follow me on Twitter or you can email me as well. But very happy to take questions from the audience about any topic. Yes. Hi. Uh, in terms of commodities, what do you think is the appetite? A. B is uh, um, with the 10 percent limit, it practically makes it impossible for somebody to have only commodity only fund. So it has to be blended with uh, commodity focused equities or something. The second, and what would be the appetite for such funds? Right. Given the tax structures also, and so more of commodities are pure play. You have uh, short dated liquid contracts. So there would be a lot of churning, per se. Yeah. So I'll just give you a perspective from global markets on how asset classes are built, okay? An asset class is built on one of three core ideas. Either you do arbitrage, so in the case of commodities, agri-arbitrage or you know some kind of precious metal arbitrage. Right, which is not really present today at least, but it was present let's say three, four years ago. Or you have to build it on some kind of index fund where you convince somebody about the beta on the long term returns. Now one of the challenges in commodities is that commodities don't have a long term return. For example, today I can tell you that no matter what is happening, 10 years hence, the Sensex will be at 1 lakh crores. But I can't tell you with any certainty what the price of oil or the price of gold will be 10 years from now. So that only leaves the third category, which is fund manager or fund house expertise driven. To be very honest, here we don't see a lot of talent in the fund management space. There are some people that trade commodities, you know, but there is very few people who would be, you know, sort of ready to build this business with all, to answer all of the questions that I raised here. So it has to be a house for whom commodities is central, right? So uh, there are many Indian corporates that are in the commodity value chain there are global commodity players like, you know, uh, an Arthur Daniel Midlands or, you know, Bungie, Cargill, etc., that could potentially build that space, but it will take one of them to build it or a team that moves to a traditional AMC. So hopefully that answers your question. I'll take that question offline. I'd rather, you know, uh, something either it's going to be arbitrage, either it's an index fund, or it's going to be something that is actively managed. And at least today, it seems like an actively managed fund will be the most likely to succeed. I'd, let's park. Yeah. Hi. Uh, 
Yeah. See, in one of your slide, uh, which is if you are a hedge fund uh, uh, long only AIF, uh, where you mentioned there is a tax blockage for the client. Can you elaborate on that point? What, is, what does it mean? Sure. That means that if you are a category three AIF, it is the fund that is paying tax on the fund's PAN card. The individual transactions don't show up on the client's. Fall under EEE -E -E category? No, it will still be EPE. -E. Fund, fund will pay tax. Fund will pay tax. Fund will pay tax. ETE. -E. ETE, -E, but it is not going to be, uh, it's not going to contaminate anybody's books of accounts. Income tax is not going to come back and say, you know, now there's suddenly a scrutiny matter because you have all this huge FNO in trading on your books. But that can happen in a PMS. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Questions at the back. Hi. Uh, I have a question regarding the 2x leverage. Yes. Are there guidelines regarding leverage on option strategies? Uh, simple strategies like covered calls. So how, how does this 2x work? Right. So the. So if you're selling options, it is on the exposure. If you're buying options, it is on the premium, right? And this definition is settled. And in 2012, this, when this circular was being drafted, SEBI was very, very paranoid that there isn't there isn't somebody that you know gets into some kind of short gamma strategy and blows up the industry or creates some kind of systemic risk. Because all it takes is for one big failure to wipe everybody's reputation out. So today in category three AIF, because of design and because of client demand also, there isn't a demand for a lot of, there isn't a lot of options based strategies that are going on. It's about taking, you know, fundamental or directional views in equity. And uh, uh, even for uh, hedging with, say, nifty futures, uh, so what is the definition of, uh, of leverage? Suppose you are running a 100 crore fund. So how much of nifty futures can you take? And how, how is the leverage calculated to X? So I think this, you know, look, this is very well spelled out in the circular that's available on SEBI's website, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the, uh, you know, your custodian or the regulator is very, very happy to answer questions on calendars, on index futures, et cetera, et cetera, right? But all I'm saying is that 2x is a given. Um, I represent Milestone Trusteeship. We act as a trustees for AIFs. Yeah. So for category three, we are a little hesitant while accepting such assignments, uh, given that there is no tax pass through. So what is that the trust, from a trustee perspective, being a representative SSE for the <coughs> trust, that a trustee should uh, be careful about? Sure. So I think uh, that's a very good question. Uh, from the trustee's perspective, one is that partner with reputable fund managers and AMCs and partner with and also make sure that they have a reputable auditor in place, right? And as a trustee, right, uh, your role is also to oversee and make sure that there's nothing that is going wrong. So if there is something that you feel is still amiss, you should be a, not be afraid to speak up. It will be 30 percent for all the transactions under the trust or? It will depend on the kind of fund that you're running and I think that is uh, a fund by fund kind of arrangement. Also one more question. You have explained about a pro book against a AIF. Yeah. Uh, will that uh, comparison apply similarly to an angel uh, investor uh, group and a AIF because a lot of people are coming with a pro proposal for an angel fund to us and uh, just 
if we can throw some light and guide them? Sure. Uh, so the, the framework that I gave right, is actually general to any kind of fund. Right? To change the assumptions, right? I only gave you a very, very rudimentary business plan. Right? Obviously, an angel fund will have a much higher upside. Right? Uh, but then also, it's tougher to raise large money in an angel fund. So it will be a case by case basis and there's nothing that stops anybody from, if you want to start an AIF, you can do that. I'm only saying as a business perspective, sometimes you have to take a step back and say what are the economics for the business. But if somebody wants to do it big, no, great. Thank you. Question at the back. Hi. Uh, so I just had a question on that 2x leverage. Uh, basically, I just wanted to understand uh, uh, because I'm I'm curating a prop desk. So is it uh, applicable on like an intraday leverage as well, or it's like a, over a period of one month or one week? How, how does that? I mean, when that 2x cap is there, is it on intraday as well? It Sebi. Sebi is very strict. It applies at every single point in time. You can't be running 4x in the middle of the day and then, you know, come down to one and a half x at the end of the day. These are the kind of things that can actually cause you to lose your license in an audit, right? So, what I'm saying to you as as a proprietary desk, when you go into this space, you'll have to focus on strategies that have a high ROA, return on assets, not strategies that rely on a large amount of leverage. Even even the high frequency trading sort of a thing as well. Yes, right? so uh, this platform is actually not suitable for a lot of high frequency trading because you need, you know, you're obviously making small amounts of money or spreads over a large, uh, you know, over a large, uh, number of trades. And again, to just give you a, a point of reference, uh, somebody like an ST Advisors out of Delhi, which is a very prominent high frequency trading firm, has not ventured into AIF because it doesn't suit their, their, their strategies and their ideas. Yeah, basically it's an ex ST Advisors team. Sorry. As well. It's an ex ST Advisors team who's running yes. this thing. So okay. I'm saying that if you're and again, to give you an example, if you're just doing index arbitrage, you know, buying the Nifty and selling the constituents, then first of all, there may not be enough capacity in those kind of ideas to generate returns. Okay. For it to be meaningful for you, and B, you know, it may, will not fit the leverage requirements. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Nalan. Yes. How do you see cryptos as an asset class for AIFs? Sorry? How do you see cryptocurrencies as an asset class for AIFs? No chance. No chance. Right? Uh, look, ultimately, we can only invest in things that where the government has a favorable view and there is no it's a flat no. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Great, so there are none. Thank you once again. Uh, hopefully this was insightful. And thank you.